Good evening, everyone. A couple people taking their seats yet. Yeah, everyone's welcome. Come on in. There's still a couple. And there's some room in the sides upstairs if you guys in the back need some room. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I'm just really excited with this crowd. Just a quick reminder, please make sure your uh, cell phones are on silent or turned off. We don't want to disturb Esther as she is sharing her story with us tonight. Again, I appreciate you coming out to Penn College. Please give a warm Penn College welcome to our guest speaker of the evening, Esther Bauer. You want to move this? They don't know. Can I put this over here? Yeah, because I'm so short. Too. Okay. No, this is fine. Oops. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> my name is Esther Bauer. You've heard that. My maiden name was Jonas, like the Jonas Brothers, but no relation. <laughs> and uh, I was born in the city of Hamburg in Germany in 1924. You don't have to take out your calculators. I was just 89 years young. <clears throat> well, when I was nine years old, yeah, my father was the principal of the Jewish girls' school in Hamburg. We had 600 girls. And according to Jewish law, a Jew is only a person whose mother is Jewish because you always know who the mother is, but you don't always know who the father is. They were quite smart, the old Jews. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, the first years I... Uh, uh, was a regular life for a middle class child. And um, in 1933, Hitler came to power. I was nine years old. I don't remember much what happened then. And my parents always tried to not to talk in front of me, so I never knew what was happening, which was a big mistake because I had to go to other people and ask what, uh, what happened. And um, <clears throat> then always new laws came. Uh, the Jews had to give 90% of their uh, money, whatever it was, back to the Nazis. And, um, <clears throat> and every week then uh, we weren't allowed to have kosher meat anymore. My father was very orthodox. He wouldn't e eat anything else. Even in the camp, he didn't eat the meat. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> like every week or every month, some new laws came. Uh, Jewish teachers weren't allowed to teach anymore in public schools. Jewish children had to go to a Jewish school. Now, like I said, my father was very orthodox, and he had to accept now children whose mothers were not Jewish. If the father was Jewish, they had to go to the Jewish school. And these children had never learned Hebrew or anything like that, and it was very hard for them. And um, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, like I said, always new laws. Uh, civil servants couldn't, they were fired from their jobs. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, um, uh, then one day we weren't allowed to go to concerts anymore, or to, to the opera, or to theater. And I wasn't allowed to go swimming anymore. I loved to go swimming. And uh, like I said, things got progressively worse. And uh, in 1938, you might have heard of Crystal Night, the Nazis uh, uh, burned all the synagogues. My father was warned. Somebody told him that something would happen. We didn't know what, he didn't know what. And he went to a teacher of our school who was of Czech nationality, and he stayed with her family overnight. And uh, the Gestapo, you know what the Gestapo was, the uh, 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 secret police 
They were terrible, terrible people. They came to the door and wanted to arrest my father, but my mother said, you see, he is not here. My mother was a medical doctor. She had been a Red Cross nurse in World War I, and <clears throat> there were already uh, soldiers who did not want to be taken care of by a Jewish nurse. Her name was Levinson. She had no idea about Judaism. She didn't know Hebrew. She had never been to a synagogue. And uh, she made her doctor after she was a nurse and, uh, in 1922. And she uh, went to the Hartz Mountains on vacation. And in the train, she met my father. And uh, they got married. And uh, uh, I always thought they didn't fit together at all. But apparently, they were quite happy together. So um, my father tried to teach her Hebrew, but it was not, not possible. And um, <clears throat> so I had both parents in school. I had to go to my father's school. I hated every day of it. Can you imagine, you have your father there, you have your mother there, and uh, I had my father as a teacher, and he would call on me by name, and the whole class would laugh, so he didn't, uh, he didn't call on me anymore, so I didn't have to study anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, like I said, things got progressively worse. Crystal Night was a horrible, horrible thing. They burned all the synagogues, and one of my teachers uh, went into the burning. It was a beautiful, big synagogue in Hamburg, an Orthodox synagogue, and uh, he went in there and rescued one Torah scroll, and his son gave this uh, uh, to the museum in New York, the Holocaust Museum in New York. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my classmates started to emigrate in uh, 1938, 1939. I could only go to school till 1939. I was 15 years old. I had nine years of schooling, and I've never gone back to school. Um, well, uh, what did I forget? <laughs> Yeah, my father brought two transports to England with uh, England accepted children and um, he, he went twice to England and came back and I wasn't allowed to go because he said I would take the place of another child. Another thing, uh, the first day of school in Germany, every child gets a, a, a bag, a cone-shaped bag with sweets in it and uh, pencils and uh, erasers, etc., etc. And my father came to me and said, look, there are some poor children in school. They may not get one, and you will not get one either. I was the only poor child. I never got one. I never forgave my father for that. <laughs> Like I said, my father was very orthodox. I always liked to do things like string pearls when I was five years old or so. And came Friday night, he would say, now is the Sabbath, you have to stop. And I could never understand why I had to stop doing something that gave me so much pleasure. And I don't understand it to this day. Anyway, so uh, things got progressively worse one morning. I come to the park, which I had to go through to go to the subway station. Hamburg is a big city, two million people, and there were 20,000 Jews in Hamburg. And um, I come to the park, and there's a sign, Jews not allowed in here. And there was a man who took care of the park, and he, he knew me by name. He said, Miss Esther, you cannot come in here anymore. So, and I always liked to play in the park, but that was forbidden. And then when I was 16 years old, we had to wear the yellow star on the clothing and also on the door to the apartment. My baby nurse, who was not Jewish, and she was like a mother to me, she was wonderful, and uh, she would come at night and bring us uh, food that we couldn't get anymore. We were not allowed to go to a 
regular store. We had a, a special store just for Jews, and there was very little food to be had. And my father at that time allowed my mother and me to eat the non-kosher meat. He wouldn't touch it. And uh, <clears throat> then one day, yeah, my father had to report to the Gestapo. You know what the Gestapo was. And uh, every week, and unfortunately, I say that this Mr. Goetsche was very nice to my father. He didn't say, you miserable Jew. He said, Dr. Jonas, sit down. And he talked to him like a human being. And uh, well, we, uh, one day a Nazi doctor wanted our apartment. And we had to move to a so-called Jewish house, which was a terrible apartment with no central heating and no hot water. But my mother had been in the First World War, and she knew how to uh, light a stove and all that. I couldn't have done it, and my father was completely unable to do anything in the house. He only studied all the time. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, we moved to that apartment, and we, then we had to wear the star, and I used to wear my uh, my pocketbook like this so so people wouldn't see that I was Jewish. And uh, I had some half-Jewish friends and uh, my father never allowed me to go to the movies. I don't know why. He said he had heard that a movie house in Chicago burned down and children were killed. I don't think that was the reason. He just didn't want me to go to the movies. But I went behind his back with... Uh, <laughs> with my half-Jewish friends, and I didn't wear the star. And I got myself a hat from his mother, uh, because uh, you had to be 18 years old, usually, to see the nice films, and I was only 16 or so. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> like I said, <clears throat> sorry, most of my girlfriends had left. And um, then one day, uh, we get a, a, a letter on that and that day. You have to be ready. Uh, you can take one suitcase along, and you are going to a ghetto called Theresienstadt or Terezin in Czech. And um, well, we knew about Auschwitz. A person had come back from there. Don't ask me how. I don't know. And he told us all what was happening in Auschwitz. But we were going to Terezin. OK, we are on the station, uh, on the train station. And uh, this Mr. Goetsche, this SS man, came to my father and said, don't worry, Dr. Jonas. You will have your school again. You will see how nice it is. My father had to get rid of the school, of everything that was in it. and. Uh, and uh, he said, <clears throat> and I was 18 years old at the time. Now I have to go back. When I was 15 and had to leave the school, I had to do forced labor in a factory. And I worked there for about three years till, uh, till we were sent to Terezin. And uh, so we go into this train and uh, drove forever. And finally, we came to a Czech a city, and there was no train, no uh, uh, tracks yet to go into Terezin. We had to carry, we had three heavy suitcases. My father wasn't able to carry, so my mother and I carried the three suitcases, and we marched into Terezin. Terezin was a, a garrison town for the Czech military. And uh, they had these stone barracks, four-sided stone barracks with a courtyard in the middle. And then there were some smaller houses uh, where the business people had lived. And uh, we, we, we come into this one barrack, and from one minute to the next, we were prisoners. And uh, we, we, we go in there, and in the courtyard, we are told, put your suitcases down here. Needless to say, we never saw them again. And we had to go up on the attic, which was like two, two flights up. And uh, we walked by. Now, everybody in Terezin was Jewish. We hardly ever saw the SS who were in charge. 
and um, we walked by the kitchen and there stood a young man and looked at me. I was 18 years old and I assume I didn't look too bad, so uh, I knew he would come after me. Anyway, we go up on the attic and it's a terrible, terrible place. Stone floor, dirty, no tables, no chairs, no mattresses, nothing, 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 just a stone floor. And the worst part were the latrines, men, women, children together, it was just awful. And uh, you had to sit and sleep on that stone floor, you didn't have pillows, you didn't have blankets, you had nothing, just what you had on your body. And uh, my newfound friend, Honza, came and he spoke Czech and I spoke German and we couldn't talk to each other. So he, uh, he got somebody else to interpret for us and uh, I made up my mind, I'm going to learn the language and I did later. Anyway, uh, uh, he gave out the food, the food was given out in the courtyard and uh, Oh yeah, I have to go back to Hamburg. On the highest holiday, Yom Kippur, it was announced in the synagogues that you have to go home now, get your radios, and bring them to the police station. And my father said to my mother and me, you go, he wouldn't go. And uh, that's how we, we didn't even have radios anymore. Television didn't exist yet. And uh, so I'm in Terezin on this terrible attic and uh, uh, we had to sleep there and sit there. And, but we had to go down to the courtyard to get the food, which was terrible. It was rotten potatoes. And my newfound friend gave me right away two rotten potatoes. I couldn't even eat one. It was so awful. So... Uh, then, as I said, after six weeks, my father died, and I always said he died more of a broken heart than of the sickness, because that they had lied to him, he, he could not accept that. And, uh, <clears throat> and by the way, this Mr. Gucci killed himself after the war. That's the only good thing about this. So, um, uh, we, uh, eventually, the food got a little better, and uh, <clears throat> and then I got very sick. I got double pneumonia. And uh, in Germany, I don't know if I mentioned that, Jewish uh, physicians were not allowed to work as doctors anymore. They had to go and take care of uh, sick people at night. My mother was never home at night. She always had to go and take care of somebody. And in Terezin, they made her a doctor again but she had hardly any medicine and she could only <clears throat> be nice to people and uh, give them a good word or a piece of cotton if they needed it. And uh, then uh, I got very sick and Honza was able to find a sick room where the, the doctor had medicine <clears throat> and uh, uh, I was better already when I had a, uh, uh, a relapse with high fever and uh, he ran through the whole city which wasn't allowed at that time. Later on you could walk but uh, not when we got there. And he found the doctor and brought her back and she gave me an injection and said if she would have come uh, two hours later, I probably wouldn't have been alive anymore. So I owe this man my life. And uh, he also was able to get my mother and me into a smaller room, not in the barracks. You had hundreds of people living in one room with three beds above each other and one nail for, for your clothes. And we he was able to get me into a smaller room, my mother and me and five other people, women. And <clears throat> but we had to go down uh, in the courtyard and pump water. There was no running water, except luckily there was a toilet with running water. And uh, um, uh, his brother, see there was a hierarchy in, in Terezin. The Czech Jews who came at first 
got the best jobs, the best rooms, the best everything. So my friend Honza's brother had been in that first transport and he made Honza a cook. He wasn't a cook by profession, but uh, in Terezin he was. And uh, uh, he was an architect uh, uh, in normal life, but in Terezin he was a carpenter. And he made my mother and me a bed that you could pull out at night and we got two mattresses and we got blankets and that was wonderful. And uh, uh, like I said, the food was awful, but uh, later on it got a little better, but you got very little food. You got one slice of bread in the morning and then a watery soup for lunch and, and dinner. Sometimes there was something in that soup, but uh, not very much. But Honza was able to, to steal for my mother and me enough food that we were not so terribly hungry. Many people died of typhus and uh, uh, it, was, it was just awful. And uh, I was lucky he got me a job in the youth organization. I didn't have to go into the fields or, uh, or clean uh, latrines or clean houses or uh, whatever it was, and there were factories, and uh, people died of uh, asbestos, and uh, it, it was just terrible. Anyway, um, we men and women were, were strictly separated, and uh, the cultural life in Terezin was wonderful. They had the best uh, artists who had not been able to emigrate, so we had musicians, we had lecturers, we had uh, composers. A very nice uh, children's opera was composed called Brundiba. I've seen it in Terezin and I've seen it in Hamburg and I've seen it in New York. It's a wonderful opera for children. And that was composed in Terezin. And um, one day everybody had to get out of the ghetto we were put onto a meadow and were counted. The Nazis were crazy about counting. And we spent this whole day on the meadow and we thought we would never get back. And if we get back, we wouldn't find, not that we had much, but whatever it was. And, uh, but we came back and uh, I don't know what this was all about, but it happened. And then one day they started to paint all the buildings. A uh, Red Cross mission from Sweden was supposed to come and see how wonderful the Jews have it in Terezin. And children were filmed and saying, oh, sardines again, never got sardines. And they, they put uh, cans of sardines in front of them. And after this commission was gone, they took them away again. Anyway, they, the, these Red Cross people thought, ah, the Jews have it wonderful in Terezin. Well, it wasn't so. And, uh, well, the, one of the uh, uh, horrors was that transports came in and transports went out, and the ones that went out went to the east, mainly to Auschwitz. And uh, I had to write, I worked in this youth organization, I had to write on cards with a pencil the name of each child under 18. Uh, children lived in a certain uh, children's home. They got a little more to eat. They got milk and uh, a little more food. And I had to write every name uh, when the child was born, where it had lived. And uh, if that child was sent out, I had to erase it and take the next one. And I did that for, for two years. And one of my co-workers uh, was able to teach me Czech, so at least I could talk to Hansa. And uh, well, after two years, Hansa was told they needed so and so many men to build up a new ghetto near Dresden. Dresden is another German city. And... Uh, <clears throat> And we decided to get married. You could get married 
And like I said, you couldn't live together, but we found ways. There were always people who had a room and let you have it for an hour. Anyway, Um, so uh, uh, we decided to get married, and after three days, uh, Honza had to leave. And we were, this was a so-called ghetto marriage. We were told after the war we have to uh, renew the vows. They would be predated to that day, but we didn't care. Anyway, he left, and uh, of course I was very sad. And one day, the women of these men were told, uh, you can go voluntarily after your husband. And uh, I said, of course I'll go. My mother was still alive, and she said, uh, don't go, don't go, stay here. I said, no, I always do what my insights tell me. And my insights said, go. Well, to say goodbye to your mother, of course, is terrible. And uh, unfortunately, a week after I had left, she was sent to Auschwitz and she was killed. Well, I'm sitting in the train with other people, of course, and uh, all of a sudden I see Polish names, and I knew we were not going to Dresden but to Auschwitz. And we landed in Birkenau, Auschwitz. And uh, there stood this Dr. Mengele with his dog and said, you go right, you go left. I went right, and my good friend who had taught me Czech went left. And we walked by a barrack, and the people came out and yelled, if you have any bread, throw it over, because they will take it away from you. Well, a girl next to me threw her bread over, and she was shot immediately right next to me. It could have hit me, but I was always lucky. And I don't know if I mentioned that before. I can only tell you what happened to me personally. There are thousands of other stories. I, Even though I landed in Auschwitz, I was very, very lucky. Well, we go into the shower. They shaved off our hair and uh, took everything away. I still had a watch from Hamburg, and I threw it on the floor because I didn't want the Nazis to get it. And uh, we thought, well, this is the end. But water came out. And they gave us very flimsy clothing. It was uh, October in Poland. It was cold. And, uh, and the Nazis were crazy about counting, as I said before. We had to stand at attention for hours and hours. It snowed on us. It rained on us. We had nothing on the head. We had the shaved off hair. And, uh, and to sit in the barracks and do nothing is also terrible. I'd rather work than sit and do nothing for hours and hours and think, well, maybe tonight they will kill me. And at night, they took the people out of the barracks, put them into trucks, drove them into the gas chamber, and of course, they knew where they were going, and they screamed. I hear that today yet. And also the smell of Auschwitz, the burning flesh. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. And to explain Auschwitz in a few words is, is very hard. Uh, I can only touch on it. And then one day, after about two weeks, we were told we did not get a tattoo. We were supposed to either be killed or sent out again to, to work somewhere. And uh, after two weeks, we were told, you go into the shower today. And we figured, well, that is the end. But water came. So they gave me one pair of underpants, a summer dress, a very thin coat, wooden shoes, no socks, no stockings, nothing. We had absolutely nothing, just the clothing on our body. And uh, we were put into a train and driven to Freiburg in Saxony, that's a city near Dresden. This was a former China factory, but uh, the Nazis had uh, uh, turned it into uh, airplane uh, manufacturing. And before us, there were uh, um, prisoners of war there, and we come in, oh, it's wonderful, warm in the factory, 
and they had these wooden beds with a straw sack on it, and you always two girls to one bed. God forbid they give you one bed, you know. So uh, the lady next to me, I said, do you want to? I didn't know her, she said, sure. Uh, her name was Charlotte Stein, I called her Lotte. Anyway, so we, uh, <clears throat> we lie down in the bed and the light goes out and the bed bugs and the fleas and the uh, lice, uh, it was horrible. Today, if you itch, you go to a drugstore and buy something. We had nothing, absolutely nothing. <clears throat> we had no handkerchief. We had no uh, soap. We had no toilet paper. We had absolute no toothbrush, no toothpaste, no cream for the face, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just the clothes on our uh, body. And we had to work 12 hours a day building airplanes. Uh, it was um, two, two girls. Uh, one had an air hammer, one had a piece of iron, and you got the rivets out of the steam and the SS Oberscharführer, who was in charge of this camp, he beat us with his leather belt at all time. It was just horrible. We had to go every hour and get the rivets. And uh, so you put this together, that's how, how we built airplanes at the time. And the only act of sabotage I was able to do to make the rivets either too short or too long, they couldn't uh, see that after this whole piece was closed. The Nazis couldn't check on that. And uh, I always say, no airplane will ever fly that I built. <laughs> I, I, I hope. <laughs> so uh, Lotte and I worked on the same piece. So we were together like 24 hours a day. And all you could do is talk. and. I heard this from other people too, we only talked about food. The food was, uh, I, I can't explain it. It was, again, one piece of bread in the morning that had to last you all day. Um, a watery soup for lunch, a watery soup for dinner, and nothing else. And later on they built us barracks outside the city, so uh, at least we were rid of the, the bed bugs and stuff and we had to march in every morning, and on the way we grabbed the grass from the, from, uh, from the floor and, uh, uh, because we were so terribly hungry. Now, I had a German, an elderly German foreman who was very nice. He, uh, uh, he was an elderly man who couldn't go to the army, and he sometimes put a piece of bread there for, for me, and that was, of course, great. Now, once a week, we got one pat of margarine. That had to last you also all week. And for my 21st birthday, my friend Lotte gave me her weekly ration of one pat of margarine as a present. And I didn't know, should I put it on my face or should I eat it? I don't remember what I did. And uh, the, not only were there the Nazi men, there were also SS women, and they were worse than the men. They were terrible. You had to stand at attention if you needed to go to the bathroom, and if that uh, woman didn't want you to go, you couldn't go all day to the bathroom. I washed out my underpants in cold water without soap, without anything, and uh, put it on the heating system. Luckily, I worked next to the heating system and uh, put it on in the evening again. It, it was, uh, I cannot tell you how poor you can be. We had no paper to write. We had nothing to read. We, uh, we had absolutely nothing. And still, you can live. And uh, we saw Dresden burning at night. We, we, saw, we worked from either 12 midnight to 12 noon or from 12 noon to midnight. And, uh, and we heard already the shooting of, of the Allies, uh, the Russians on the right, the Allies on the left. But we were still working. And then one day there was no more raw material coming in. 
you know, trains uh, uh, were very few and, uh, and they just didn't have anything anymore. But we had to stand there and file pieces of aluminum just like this, uh, showing the Nazis that we were working. And uh, I was able to make myself a comb because after nine months, the hair had grown again. And I still have this comb, it's in my safe in New York. And uh, well, then one day we were told, you are going into a train. Well, we thought, now we go back to Auschwitz. We did not know that Auschwitz was already liberated. They were liberated in January, and this was April. And we are, we are put into open coal cars, and we had just enough room for the behind. You couldn't lie down, you could just sit, and it was horrible, hardly anything to eat. The checks were very nice. They threw bread into the trains. They knew uh, what was going on, but uh, it wasn't enough, of course. And at night, we stood still, and uh, the train only went during the day. And uh, when we went uh, through Czechoslovakia, my friend Lotte, who came from Czechoslovakia, said to me, I'm going to jump over tonight. Come with me. I said, no, I will not do that. The Czechs will know I'm German. The Germans will know I'm Jewish. It's a no-win situation. So she jumped over and I heard shooting and I was sure that she was dead. Well, we go on and nobody had room for a thousand women. And uh, we finally land in Mauthausen in Austria. And... Uh, <clears throat> There, uh, the man who gave out the, the watery soup was a friend of my husband's, and he right away gave me two portions, and if you haven't eaten for two weeks, uh, you cannot eat that much, but I was so hungry, I, I ate this, and I got deathly sick, of course. Well, I had to share the bed again with another girl. She died during the night, and all the vermin goes from a dead body to a live body, so I had that misery again, and I was sick. And one morning, my friends around me said, you know, the Germans are all gone. I said I couldn't believe it, but it was true. And the Americans came up the hill and uh, with a white flag and liberated us. And that, of course, was the happiest day of my life, as you can imagine. Though I was very sick, I said to myself, now I want to live, now I want to have fun, now is, is the time to live. Because from 18 to 21, I was in concentration camps. Those are usually the nicest years of your life. But, well, uh, like I said, we were liberated, and the Americans nursed me back to health. And the first American soldier I met said to me in the most beautiful Hamburg German, well, miss, where are you from? I said, from Hamburg. He said, so am I. He was a refugee who had come in 1938 to America. He was drafted into the American army, and he liberated me. And he went after one of those SS women. Uh, he found out where she lived. He took a big suitcase and put wonderful clothing in there and brought it to me. And I got, I'll never forget, I got a, a dark green woolen suit with a fur, black fur color, and I was happy. And uh, I met this, uh, this soldier again in, in New York many years later. <clears throat> well, um, I uh, um, offered my help in the office uh, with the American soldiers. I had twi five years of English in school, but I wanted to learn American English, and uh, I learned it through them. And one day I said to one sergeant, I said, where do you come from? Not that my geography was so good. And he said, from Iowa. I said, is that near Illinois? He said, yes. And I said, I have an uncle in Peoria, Illinois, of all places. And he had immigrated in 1938 and, 
and the Jewish organization had given him money to open a dry goods store in, uh, in Peoria. Well, he found my uncle and I got his address and that's how I got in touch with my uncle. And uh, after a few weeks, uh, the Russians took over Mauthausen and uh, some girlfriends and I uh, decided we don't want to go with the Russians and we went to the next American occupied city that was Linz on the Danube. And in Linz we rented an apartment. I have no idea how we financed it because we had no money, of course, but somehow it worked. I got myself a job with the American government there. And in Germany and in Austria, you have to be registered with the police at all time something that would never happen here. And uh, um, I registered, of course, in that apartment, and I got myself a job, like I said, and uh, one day we decided, oh, we are going to move into a DP camp, a displaced persons camp, because there we didn't have to pay and we would get more to eat. There was no food after the war uh, for, for Austrians and for Germans, and we, of course, were, were one of them because we didn't get any privileges, especially not in Austria. The Austrians were very, very anti-Semitic. And um, so we moved into that DP camp, and I did not, I forgot to register myself at the police, so I was still registered in that uh, apartment. And a former friend of mine in Hamburg uh, heard that I was liberated in Mauthausen. And he again had a friend who had a small truck. And they went from army post to army post to beg for gasoline. You could not buy gasoline at that time. And they managed to come to the Austrian border and were told 24 hours to find me and then they have to be out of Austria again. Well. They come there and find out that Mauthausen is now in, uh, in Russian hands. And he said to himself, well, what would Esther do? Oh, she goes to the next American occupied city, which was true. It was a Saturday afternoon. He goes to the, uh, uh, to the police station and is told, I live in that apartment. Of course, he comes there. Esther doesn't live there anymore. So he was half Jewish, his mother was not Jewish, and uh, uh, his mother who had kept all photographs and everything. He was only six months in, in Terezin, and, um, and he was liberated and came back to Hamburg. So uh, uh, he went with my picture into those stores, they were just about to close, and uh, one woman said, yeah, she lives up on the hill there in the DP camp. Well, it is Saturday afternoon, Esther is in the movies. You know, my father had never allowed me to go. I went to the movies. So uh, when I came back, there was my old friend Heinz, and I couldn't believe it, and I packed my three things and went back with them to Hamburg. And in Hamburg, I wanted my apartment back where that Nazi had thrown us out of. It was not a, we didn't own the apartment, it was a rental apartment. And the British said, no, you can have one room in the apartment with that Nazi still in it. I said, no, thank you. And I moved to Bremen, which was an American enclave. And there again, I worked for the Americans and my uncle had sent me an affidavit of support, and I got visa number one from Bremen to come to America, but I was not on the first boat, I was on the second boat. And uh, <clears throat> my girlfriend, uh, uh, who had found me uh, by letter and said that I could live with her and her parents in Washington Heights in New York as long as I wanted to, and uh, she picked me up from the boat, and we went home to her parents, a wonderful dinner, and they were kosher. And afterwards, she said to me, would you like some ice cream? Now, if you have eaten meat, you're not supposed to have ice cream for a number of hours, but we didn't care. 
And uh, so we went to Broadway, and <clears throat> there at that time on every corner was uh, an ice cream parlor, and I order my banana split, and I'm very happy. And in walked two men, and uh, one was, uh, no, I have to go back yet. In Hamburg, I found out that my mother was sent to Auschwitz and killed, and that my husband didn't come back either. And uh, so uh, I, these two men come in, and one was her boyfriend, of whom I didn't know, and the other one was his buddy from the army. And uh, the buddy asked me, are you the girl that just came from Germany? I said, yeah, this morning. He said, oh, I pictured you quite differently. You don't have pigtails. I couldn't have had pigtails because they shaved off our hair. And you speak English, yes. And him I married two years later. And I was married 46 years. I have one son and two grandchildren. And 10 years ago, I met my boy toy, Bill. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I want many questions. Yes, uh, that, is, that is in Mauthausen. Mauthausen was a stone quarry, a terrible, terrible camp. There were not so many Jews as uh, uh, gay people. There were gypsies. There were people uh, from Turkey. There were people from Greece. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible camp. And as you can see, that's very high, and the Nazis just pushed them down, and when they landed uh, down, they were dead. It, it was just a horrible, horrible camp. Luckily, when we got there, the gas chamber was closed already, and, uh, and we were liberated. That's my girlfriend, Hannelore. The dresses we made out of the uh, curtains of the SS women, uh, they had fled, of course, and we got their rooms, and we, we sewed that by hand, and because there were no machines, and that was the first dress, uh, uh, besides the, uh, this was in the summer, and later I had that wonderful green suit that that uh, soldier had gotten for me. And uh, unfortunately, my girlfriend died like 10 years ago, but she was my best friend ever. And whenever, if we didn't see, she lived in Canada, and if we didn't see each other for 10 years, it was just like we had left yesterday. I can't understand. What was my best what? What did you feel was your, oh. Within a given concentration camp, what did you feel was like a, the happiest and saddest moment you ever experienced, excluding well, your liberation? Well, the saddest moment was, of course, when I found out that my whole family was dead. And uh, the happiest moment was when I was liberated. You cannot imagine the feeling. They are gone. It, 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 you know, they had been there for so many years for me, and uh, all of a sudden, we were free. Well, we were a thousand women, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned that before, we did not get a number, because uh, we were supposed to either go to work or be killed. Um, I don't know how many were liberated. I couldn't tell you. It wasn't only us. There were other people there, too, men, you know, who, who had been there. Um, I don't know the numbers, but six million Jews were killed by Hitler. And then he killed another 11,000 uh, 11, or even more uh, um, Catholic priests were, were tortured and killed and uh, uh, homosexuals were, were terribly treated, gypsies were terribly treated, also killed. Hmm? Yeah, mentally retarded, they just killed. There was no hope for them. 
he did terrible, terrible things, and uh, uh, and if you were against him, like I once spoke in Slovenia, that was a uh, satellite camp of of uh, Mauthausen, and uh, there were not Jews, but there were other men who were worked to death. And 2,000 people listened to my speech, which has to be translated. I spoke in German, and they translated it into Slovenian. And two elderly women came to me with a number from Auschwitz. I said, are you Jewish? They said, no, we were anti-Nazi, and they also put them into Auschwitz. Luckily, they were not killed. No, my father, I, I understood that. My, yeah, my father said, I have done nothing wrong. Nothing will happen to me. Of course, he was completely wrong. My mother spoke English perfectly. She uh, had been an au pair in England when she was a young girl. And uh, my father spoke five languages, uh, German, French, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, but not English. And he was already in his 50s, and he tried to learn it. But again, like my mother couldn't learn Hebrew, he couldn't learn English. It, it was just not possible. And uh, he didn't want it. He wanted his school. He wanted his children. And uh, in the end, uh, he lost it all. Well, I was I was raised Orthodox, but uh, I am not anymore. Well, I hear this all the time. I have never met anybody who said it to me, but I was there, and. Uh, like I said, I have pictures to prove it, but uh, uh, Eisenhower liberated Dachau and uh, Camp Dachau, and he said to his soldiers, take all the pictures you, you can, because there will be a time when people say this never happened, and that's exactly what happened. When you're standing cold in the snow and you can't move because they're watching you for hours. What do you put in your mind that helps you survive? Well, I'll tell you a story. I had a, a sickness many years ago. I had to go to the hospital and they called it a psychosomatic sickness and I had to see a psychiatrist afterwards. And the first question was, do I feel guilty that I was liberated and six million were killed? I said, no, I'm one of a thousand women and many are still alive. And uh, none of us were killed. People died, of course, of sicknesses. There was no medical treatment. But uh, uh, none, we were not killed. And uh, that floored him because he had patients who had a guilt complex. Well. Then the next uh, session was, do you think you need therapy? I said, I don't want to sound like all crazy people. If you think I need therapy, I will take it. But personally, I don't think I need it. I may have needed it in 1945, but this was already in the 50s. And uh, he said, OK, I agree with you. But I will tell you something. You live in a shell. You let nothing touch you. And that's how you survived. Does that partly answer your question? Yes, thank you. Where do you live now? New York City? Why? Well, I lived in Manhattan till a year ago when I moved together with my friend Bill. We live now in a senior residence in Yonkers, but we are only one house out of Yonkers, uh, out, of, uh, out of the Bronx. We are the first house in Yonkers. <laughs> And we are very happy there. What inspired you to start sharing your story with everybody? Well, the first 20 years, I couldn't talk about it. The second 20 years, nobody wanted to hear. It's only the last 25 years. 
And my second husband always said to me, when you talk about the camp, one would think you were in a summer camp. I like to remember good things. There were good things, as I told you. But of course, it was horrible. But uh, um, what was the question again? <laughs> What inspired you to start oh, sharing this? Yeah, I had a neighbor who was a teacher in a private school in Manhattan, and she said to me one day, can't you talk to my students? I said, I've never done that. She said, well, come, and, and, and you'll be fine. So she asked me questions, and that's how I slowly got into that. And uh, I've been doing it, let's say, the last 15, 16 years. Thank you. Oh yeah, um, I have to go back to Mauthausen. Um, uh, my girlfriend Hannelore and I went to Linz and one other friend, her name was Sonja Messerschmidt. Now Messerschmidt, you think of the German airplane factory, but there was also a big Jewish family in uh, Berlin uh, who, who, uh, who was called Messerschmidt. Well, Sonja said, no, I want to stay. Uh, like I said, you couldn't just take a train uh, back to Berlin or to Hamburg. And uh, she wanted to stay and see if she could meet somebody who uh, had a car and would drive her back. Well, uh, she stayed, we went to Linz, and a few days later we heard that the Russians had raped all the women in Mauthausen. So I said to Hannah Laura, I have to get Sonia out of there. I flirted with the GI, and you know Americans are very easygoing. He, <laughs> he, uh, I said, can you drive me to Mauthausen? We got permission to go and to come back. And we got there and met Sonia, and she said, oh, I'm so glad you came. They tried to break my door down, but they couldn't. Can you get me out of here? I said, sure. You lie down in the Jeep, with the, cover you with the green blankets. And that's how we got her out. And a few weeks later, she really met somebody who drove her back to Berlin. And after a long search, she met her husband again. And the last I heard that uh, uh, she had a baby in 1946 in Munich. And I come to New York. And the first thing that happens to me, my pocketbook is stolen with my address book, and I lost Sonia. Well, okay. In, in 1968, my second husband comes with a mail and says to me, you have a letter from a Charlotte Stein in Haifa. I said, that can't be, she is dead. No, they tried to, to shoot her, but they didn't hit her. And the checks, she was checked, helped her to go back to her hometown. And also she did meet her husband again. And they went to, uh, uh, to Haifa, to, to Palestine at the time. He was an architect for the city of Haifa, and she played bridge. And, uh, <laughs> And one day she played with a former teacher of the Jewish boys' school in Hamburg, the Talmud Torah school. And when she heard Hamburg, she said, oh, I had such a good friend uh, from Hamburg. Whatever happened to her? He said, I will get you her address. And uh, so she wrote to me. And in 1970, we went to Israel to visit her. Unfortunately, she also died a few years ago. She was a little older than me. To the, oh my God. <laughs> what happened to the women that were pregnant during the time? Like, they, when they went to the concentration camps, did, were they stricken from their babies? What happened to? The women that were pregnant in the concentration camps. Well, camp. um, in, in Terezin, children were born and not killed. In our camp in Freiburg, we also had a woman who was pregnant and... Uh, her child was born and was not killed. She was able to, uh, she was liberated with the child. But we, in, in Terezin, we had to sign 
that we will not get pregnant. And like I said, it was very hard to get together men and women, but of course there were women who were pregnant. But in, in Teresin, nothing happened, of course, in other camps, I can tell you I wasn't there. Mrs. Bauer, um, you said you're 89, and I know that there are not many people living anymore that have been through this. Do you get together with any of them? Oh, yes, I, I have friends. Uh, unfortunately, many died, but yeah. uh, um, I have a... My first boyfriend in Hamburg uh, was just 90 years old last week, and we, last Sunday we had a, he had a party, and it was very nice. We get together quite often, but I mean, I didn't marry him, obviously. He married somebody else. I married somebody else, but we, we are very good friends, and we never talk about the camp, if that's what you want oh, to know. Yeah. That's just not a subject we, we discuss. And I never think about it unless I, I talk to people. I'm over it now. The first 20 years I had nightmares and, uh, and uh, I just wanted to forget. We're so thankful that you are sharing this with us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Since the liberation, have you encountered any of the SS officers that... No. Okay. No, I haven't. Well, when I, I do go to Hamburg quite often, I speak there also in schools and universities, whoever wants me. I spoke in a teacher uh, um, uh, college uh, already three times. They, whenever I come to Hamburg, they ask me to speak there. Um, I have never met any of the... I don't talk to older people, but I have wonderful friends, younger people, let's say 50s, 60s, and they are just amazing. When Bill and I moved a year ago, one of them came over here just to help us move. Uh, you don't find that very often. It's a long trip from Hamburg here. And uh, I, I have just wonderful, wonderful friends over there. Hmm? Yeah, I was uh, invited in Finland in, in January. Finland is one of the few countries that's not anti-Semitic and, uh, and loves Israel. And uh, <clears throat> I spoke in a German school there and it was very well received. There is a film about me, unfortunately it's in German, so <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense to show it here. What other places have you given your speech at, like this? Hmm? Oh, don't ask. <laughs> I was in Tennessee, I was in, in Bethlehem, PA, I was in Scranton, PA, I was in uh, Hazleton, PA, I was in Watertown, New York, I was in Rhode Island, I was in Tennessee. Oh, in Tennessee, it was just a few days after my 89th birthday, and 500 people sang happy birthday to me. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> and yeah, in St. Louis, and next week we are going to Fort Drum, that is near Watertown, because when I spoke in Watertown, there were many uh, relatives of military people, and they liked it so much, so they asked me to come to uh, uh, to Fort Drum next week, and then I have vacation. No, I have not heard, <clears throat> but I know many people who went to the Catskill service in the summer. <clears throat> but when I first uh, got married, we had a dress store, and we, we couldn't take many vacations. We just got a week here and there, and uh, 
uh, my, my husband's relatives always went to the mountains. I didn't like it there. And uh, I rather stayed in the city and, and went to the opera and went to concerts and things like that. <laughs> you can understand that, right? <laughs> when you yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I came to New York and I met a, a friend uh, from Hamburg whom I hadn't seen since 1938 or so. And she said to me, oh, I live in a girl's hotel and my girlfriend just got married. If you want the other bed, $7 a week, you can have it. I made $28, $7 was a quarter, fine. So I took it and she was a wonderful person. She taught me every payday, you, whether you make $28 or you make $280, you take X amount of dollars, put it in the bank and never touch it. And I did this all my working life. I worked till I was 73 and today I can live nicely. And it's very important that you do that too. Um, when you were when you were sitting by yourself and c couldn't have anything to do, what, what did you do to occupy your mind? I didn't understand. Like when you were sitting in the barracks and you didn't have anything to do, like no work or anything. Well, we uh, <clears throat> we talked to each other, of course, but uh, it was such terrible. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. The whole thing was so awful that you, you, you just didn't know what to do. So we were also quiet, and, and then one of my friends would sing something, you know, just to entertain us. But uh, like I said, luckily it was only like two weeks. I don't remember exactly how many days, but I think it was two weeks. Well, I worked, I'm sorry, I worked in international advertising <clears throat> and we were the advertising representatives of many German papers, also Der Spiegel, which is like Time magazine. And one day I go home, I had a long subway ride and I had forgotten my paper bag, but I had Der Spiegel, which I took home every week. My husband liked it. My husband was also from Germany. And... Uh, I read about a book called Stella. Stella Goldschlag was a very pretty Jewish girl in Berlin who lived underground, a so-called U-boat. And uh, the Nazis captured her and tortured her, and she promised that she would point other so-called U-boats out to them. And I said to myself, what would I have done in that situation? You don't know. If you're tortured, you do a lot. Anyway, I read further and I see a brother and sister who had a store in my neighborhood. They were Orthodox Jews from Berlin. They were also pointed out by Stella, but uh, it was already toward the end of the war and they were only in a, in a prison, not in a concentration camp. So on Sunday, I go to their store and uh, I said, Mrs. Turner, did you know your picture was in the Spiegel? She said, oh, no, I didn't know. But she knew she was interviewed for that book. I said, I'll bring it to you next week. So next week I went with my husband there on Sunday, and, uh, and she is a big talker. She said to me, oh, I just had company from my girlfriend who married her teacher. And I said, oh, I know somebody who married her teacher. Is her name Khan? She said, no, Messerschmitt. I pushed my husband, I said, watch this. I said, is her name Sonja? She said, how did you know? I said, I lost her 40 years ago. So she lived in the state of Maine. Her husband was a cousin, a, a, a cantor in the synagogue. And uh, she had this daughter who was born in 1946, and she had another child. And uh, I called her up immediately, and at first she had no idea where I was. And she said, oh, Esther, you saved my life. And she started to cry. And then her husband came. She said, no, these are happy tears. 
And so we got together again. Unfortunately, she died two years ago. But her husband is 98, he's still alive. And he sends me emails, believe it or not. <laughs> When you were separated from your friend who taught you Czech, did you have a choice going left or right? And if you did, what made you choose right instead of left? Oh, no, no, I didn't have a choice. He, he said, you go left, you go right. You didn't have a choice. And luckily, I went to the right, which went into the showers. My friend who taught me Czech went to the left and went immediately to the gas chamber. And I had the sad uh, uh, duty to tell his father after the war that, that he was killed. How old was your son when you told him about your experiences? Well, we went to Israel in 1970, as I said. He was 15. I did not want to bother him when he was a child. And um, in Israel, we went to a kibbutz Mordechai, where they had a wonderful exhibit of Terezin, and I started to cry. And my son said to himself, I'll never talk to my mother about this. I don't want to hurt her. He is now 58 years old. He still doesn't ask me. And my grandchildren are not, not interested. I spoke in the Hebrew class of my uh, granddaughter, and there was not a single question. All they did was texting, you know, and uh, <laughs> they, they were absolutely not interested. And my grandson, when he was 18, I sat down with him. I told him the story, and all he had to say, very interesting. No questions whatsoever. Uh, how do you feel when people use the Holocaust and uh, your loved one's martyrdom and your suffering to justify their agenda? I didn't understand. Oh, uh, pardon me. Um, how do you feel when uh, people use the Holocaust to justify their agenda? To, to justify what? I don't, I don't understand oh. the question. Oh. Uh. Well. Oh, uh, for example, whenever something petty happens, be it uh, work-related, someone getting fired, and they compared their situation to the Holocaust, yeah. how do you feel <laughs> when you hear that? I don't think anything can, uh, uh, except maybe in war when, when soldiers get killed and... Uh, but I don't think uh, uh, anything can compare to the camps. It's just impossible. Hmm? I, assume, yeah. I assume you see the film, you like the whole Did you know that that was going on when it happened to him? Yeah. 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 Oh, the Weisse Rose. I don't remember what that was. Oh, oh, no, I know, I really know nothing about that, I'm sorry. Well, you want to hear a nice story? I love classical music, and I have a friend in New York who subscribed to the Philharmonic, and whenever her partner can't go, I buy the ticket. So one day she calls me, she says, you want to go? I said, sure. I didn't even ask what the program was, because they always smuggle uh, modern piece in the middle, and I want to hear the last one, so you have to hear it. Anyway, it was Beethoven and Mozart, and a composer called Schnittke. I had never heard of Mr. Schnittke, nor did I like his music, but I figured I have to read what, who he was. He was born in Russia of German parents, not Jewish, and uh, he studied in Germany and died in my hometown of Hamburg in 1998. Well, <clears throat> a few days later, uh, end of story. A few days later, I call my hairdresser 
There are two Italian brothers in the Bronx who have a little storefront. They don't talk to each other, it's very funny. They, <laughs> they cut men, women, children, dogs, whatever has hair. And, and I call, I said, Luigi, can I come today? He says, come this afternoon at three. I walk in at three o'clock. He has a, a, a customer there, a man. And all of a sudden, I hear the name Schnittke. Well, I figured I had, have to mix myself in, and Bill would say, of course you had to mix yourself in. And it turned out that he was the customer was in the same uh, concert. He loved it, I didn't. And I said to him, well, he died in my hometown of Hamburg in 1998. Oh, he says, uh, an American, I'm married to a woman from Stuttgart. I said, have you ever been to Stuttgart? He says, have I ever been to Stuttgart? I drove my tank through there in 1945. Well, then I knew he was with the American army. I said, yes, and I was liberated by the Americans in Austria. He jumps up, he says, May 5, 1945, Mauthausen. I said, yes. He said, I liberated you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. And um, my question is, um, when the Nuremberg trials happened, um, did, you, did you find yourself interested in following what was happening with that? Or was it part of just wanting to kind of forget and not well, think about that? Well, yes. I, I, of course, I watched television and uh, uh, whatever was then. I don't know whether we had television already then. And, uh, well... Um, who was it, Göring or Goebbels, who killed himself in, and uh, he, should have, he, he should have been punished, but uh, wasn't. Well, they didn't get everybody. Like I said, this, this terrible doctor who was in our apartment, he wrote um, articles about homosexuals in the, in the Third Reich against gay people. And uh, uh, I have a friend who is a history professor. He used to be at Bard College. When he heard that this Dr. Schwalke was in, in my apartment, he was beside himself. Oh, he said, that terrible cow, that terrible uh, man, he, he was just uh, uh, very, very uh, odd. But uh, I, I didn't know him, but he was in, in, in my apartment. And he himself uh, is a prof was a professor, and he is writing a book about homosexuality in the Third Reich. Oh yeah, well, uh, we had the store for a number of years. The second husband. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I saw already that business wasn't so good, so we were able to sell the store, and I learned the stenotype machine. I wanted to become a court reporter. And to learn it, that was easy for me, but 250 words a minute to write, that takes a long time. And I was sitting home and doing this all day long, and I said to my husband, I got to get myself a job. So <laughs> um, uh, I went to, from agency to agency. Nobody would hire me because I had no experience. So then my husband said, why don't you try bilingual? After all, you speak German. So I went to the first agency I saw in the phone book, and they were very nice and called me in the evening, can you come for a German test? I said, sure. But first, we have a job for you for two weeks to help out somewhere where a, a lady was hired as a secretary but wanted to go on vacation first. I said, I'll take it, then I can say I've had experience. So I walk into this office, and the boss from Berlin, a Jewish man from Berlin who had been in Shanghai, during the war, Shanghai was one of the few countries, China, that took Jews in. And uh, he uh, said to me, oh, finally, they sent me somebody decent, usually. 
this part-time help is awful, and you speak German, so where, where do you come from? I said, from Hamburg. He said, my office manager is also from Hamburg. Now, like I said before, Hamburg is a city of two million people. It has subways, it has buses, like a big city. And it turns out that the office manager and I lived in the same building in Hamburg as children, but she was a year younger than me. I didn't look at her. Her sister was a year older than me. She didn't look at me. So we knew each other, but we, we, we had no relationship, and no friendship. And she said to me, oh, I'm so sorry. We gave this job now to somebody else. If you would have come earlier, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Well, after two weeks, the boss calls me in and says, you know, next week, the other lady is coming. I said, yes, I know. He said, do you like it here? I said, yes. He said, do you want to stay? I said, yes. And I stayed there 25 years. Hello. Hello. Oh. Uh, back here, all the way in the back. No, nope, this oh, way. Yeah. OK. <laughs> no, nope, still this way. Hello. I understand you didn't come in contact with any of the SS officers. Right. But if you were to come in contact with them now or in the future, you think you'd be able to forgive them? No, you cannot forgive. Uh, that is impossible. You can forget certain things, but you cannot forgive. What they did is just... And a country like Germany, a cultural country with Beethoven and Bach and uh, Goethe and Schiller, how they, these people could do it is, is beyond me to this day. And one of my girlfriends who were not Jewish, her name was Hilde, I met her once on one of the bridges in Hamburg. Hamburg has 2,300 bridges, more than Amsterdam and Venice combined, but Americans always go to, to Munich. Anyway, I met her on a bridge and I said, Hilde, you cannot talk to me. She says, if I want to talk to you, I talk to you. She was in the Hitler Youth and all that. And after the war, I met her again and she said she was terribly ashamed. She didn't know any better. So. Uh, but uh, I have never met uh, uh, any, any SS officers or anything like that. And when I am in Germany, I, I, I go to schools mainly and, and to friends' house. Um. Can you, can you tell us how we could prevent or make sure that something like the Holocaust never happens well, again? Well, I, I always tell the classes that you have to see to it that this never happens again. You are the future of America. One of you may be president one day. Who knows? And uh, you have to see to it that this never happens again. I'd like to ask you uh, over here. <laughs> on this side, oh, this way. <laughs> Hi. I cannot imagine the, uh, the fear that you had to have dealt with on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, but also the, how did you deal with the hatred that must have built up from every instance that you went well, through? Well, I'm always asked if I hate. No, I do not hate. Hate makes you sick, hate makes you ugly. I, of course, the people who killed my parents or my husband or all my friends, I would hate. But I do not hate. But like I said before, I cannot forgive. That is impossible. Uh, you had said that Czechoslovakian people knew about what was going on. Yeah. Mm hmm. I don't know. They must have known. There is no way that they couldn't have known. I mean, in, uh, like, uh, like my friend Hilde, she never saw a concentration camp, so she didn't know. But people who lived near camps must have known.
Well, this happened mainly in Poland, and uh, the Polish people were very anti-Semitic. Uh, in Germany, it was the government that was against the Jews, even though, of course, there were anti-Semites also. But in Poland, the, the Polish people hated the Jews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I don't ever want to go to Poland again. I reluctantly go to Austria because I wasn't invited there to speak in Slovenia, which went through Austria. But uh, the Austrians are also very anti-Semitic. All right, Esther, I just want to thank you again for, for coming out tonight, and thank you all for coming. Esther will be up here if you'd like to come up and say hello to her. Thank you all again. Thank you, Esther. Tell them if they want to talk to me, they can. And if you want to come and talk to Esther personally, you can come talk to her personally right up here. If anybody would have a personal question I'd like to ask her, she's going to be right here. She'll talk. I want you to get a drink of water, though. Please. Yes. <laughs>